we were up there in this, um, in this, like Tommy calls it, a monsoon rain. It did rain very, very hard. And there was a stream right behind the, um, the thing, uh, the campground that we were at. And um, at, I took Mandy, and um, Mandy brought me a stick, and I'm like, yeah, right. And I threw it into the stream, and she jumped in after it. And she went over the rapids, hit a couple of rocks, flipped over in the water, and then I thought, as I saw her going out of my sight, I'm in big trouble because Linda's going to kill me because I will never see this dog again. And I tried to go down the rocks to try, and then she comes walking up and wagging her tail as if nothing had happened, except that when I got her home yesterday, and walked in the front door, and there the steps are in front of us, and she looked at the steps, and then she turned around to look at me, like, you're going to help me up the steps, right? And I'm like, no, I'm not going to help you up the steps. I got enough trouble on the stairs. I'm not helping you. So she, like, limped up the steps. But she's much better today. But um, it was definitely rough in it. It was really a really, really rough time. But the testimony that I have in it, as we got there, I was a little, to be honest with you, disappointed to find that there was two strangers that were also camping nearby. Two young men, maybe in their early 20s, they're camping nearby. And my, my first inclination was they're going to ruin our private time together. Okay, we want to be together. We want to hang out with men. We want to freely talk about things. And here's two guys walking in the campsite, carrying beer, you know, and so forth. And they don't have their own tarp over their fire. And they're, like, invading our privacy is basically the way I felt about it. So, um, yeah, all the thoughts. Yeah, we were a little more inviting. Apparently, yeah. So um, anyway, the long story short is that Phil reaches out to them and is nice to them, and he's, and he's uh, giving them uh, hospitality to strangers, as the Bible calls it. And he finds out from these boys that they were supposed to be in their own church men's retreat this weekend, and from a church from New Jersey called Abundant Grace, of which Phil fooled around with them and said, must be a lot of sin in your church because you need Abundant Grace. <laughs> Which, you know, it's neither here nor there. It's a little joke. And, um, and they, they had escaped their retreat to go camping in the mountains to drink beer and not have to hang out with the church guys. And God sends along a whole other group. It was just a coincidence, right? So that is just how much God cares for us. I just thought that was really cool. Are we ready? I'm sorry, this is an emotional day for me today. So anyway, here we go. Here's a video. Who God's going to send you and when, and what impact on them. Um, Phil's taking the younger ones upstairs, so bye, kids. That's terrible. Terrible. What's that? One of them was an unbeliever. The other one was a Christian, so it makes it even, even better. What a testimony to that. So um, we've been talking a little bit about warfare and, um, and about this battle. And Ephesians 6 says that our fight is not against flesh and blood. That means our fight is not against your neighbor, not against um, your boss, not against uh, the person in church that you really don't like. Um, it's not about any of those things. It's about your fight against the enemy. And we've been talking about those, those, uh, the things that God has given us for that welfare. And the one of them that I want to hit on today is called the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Obviously, the helmet protects your head. An extremely important part in our, um, in our armor. And I'm going to go over a couple of obvious things first before we get into some things you might not have ever thought about. Um, you know, Paul said that we become like Christ by having our minds renewed. And the one thing that I've, I've, it's always been one of my favorite scriptures, Romans 12, 1 and 2, you should always remember that, Romans 12, we are, by the renewing of our minds do we grow in Christ. And we prove what the will of God is by the renewing of our minds. And, and modern science is today realizing how much the mind is, how it's, being, how it's used and how it works in changing our lives and our habit patterns and causing us to be addicted to things. And then we talked a little bit about that at camping this weekend. You know, we, in our culture, we think, well, if you're addicted to something, it's drugs or alcohol. The fact of it is that most of us are addicted to other things besides that that can be just as harmful to us as those things can be. Sugar 
can be just as harmful to us and take you and shorten your life just as much as other things can be. Entertainment. The desire to, you're, you're depressed today. So, you know what? This guy always makes me laugh. I'm going to go online and I'm going to watch him for a while. That'll comfort me. That'll make, we all have our comfort things. And I, I shared this stuff at the camping trip. Um, and I, and I, I, I just did not feel like sharing this because I'm with a bunch of guys who have willingly gone out into a torrential rain to camp and obviously do not need to know how not to be comfortable. Right? And I didn't want to share it. And I felt almost foolish in sharing it. And then we didn't have any light either. So I, I, didn't, I couldn't see my notes. And, and then the rain was so heavy on the tarp over us that we had to, I had to yell so everybody could hear. And I didn't feel anything about it. But I just knew that my own life for like the last year, it's not just alcohol, but it's also, it's also in having high blood pressure. It's also the sugar intake in my life. And Mark has a testimony about sugar in his life and how it affected his health. And, and, there's, and there's other things. It's going home and it's, as soon as you go home from a day's work, you know, and your wife hits hit the door, you know, and she's got problems that she has. And that's the last thing you want to hear is her problems for today. And so you you know, turn on the TV or video games or whatever it is, you go into your comfort zone. And all of this stuff is stuff that we've learned to comfort ourselves. It's not of God. And that's the whole point of this, is that by renewing our minds, by saying no to things of the world and say yes to God, we begin to open up this connection to God where we receive comfort from a different place. And it's a supernatural comfort. And that's the comfort that brings hope to this world. It's really, really cool. So, so, the, so the modern science is realizing that all of these habitual things are pathways in our brain that like, it's like going down the path and finding a candy bar waiting for you. I like this path. I like this path. And these other pathways we have to make, sometimes they're work and they're disciplined. The word discipline is where we get the word disciples. And... Jesus said, go and make disciples, not converts. He said, go and make disciples in the world, not converts. All over the world, there's people who are saying yes to Jesus. They're saying the sinner's prayer, but they're not being made into disciples. They're not learning anything about this supernatural connection that can change your life and renew your mind. And so it's up to us to do this. So when we talk about the battle that we are facing, I just want to point out to you, I haven't done a survey, so I can't give you any hard facts, but I, if I sat down to write all the people that I know that are Christians from the last 42 years that I've been a Christian, people who are Christians who have said yes to Christ at some point, had said the sinner's prayer, and no longer go to church anywhere, they outnumber the people that I know that go to church. They outnumber them. Why is that? Why is that? Because they were converts, not disciples. And it's our fault. It's partly my fault. Because as leaders, we gave them doctrine, but we didn't give them all the equipment and training they needed for the battle. Linda, you've you got to have doctrine. You've got to know why you're here. And Linda is great at that. She just sits down with people and she just teaches you all what it's all about, what Jesus did and, and his love. And she teaches all the, the doctrinal things. But it goes farther from there because if, and Paul says in Ephesians 4 that the, that the ascension committees are to equip the saints for the work of service. That goes above and beyond the doctrine. It goes above learning your gifts. It actually learns what you should do in the middle of the battle when somebody offends you. What you should do in the middle of the battle when you just get depressed or you just don't feel God's presence. Those are the things that we haven't spoke about. That we haven't talked about at all. That's, you know, I, I, all I, when I was thinking of this, all I could think of was Forrest Gump you know, in Vietnam and he's sitting in a monsoon you know, him and Bubba leaning up against each other, and they're trying to figure out how they're going to make it. You know, that had nothing to do with training camp, had nothing to do with how learning how to, how to use their gun, nothing to do with the doctrine. It's what you do in the day-to-day -day war. It's what you do when those things happen. 
That's where the training really begins. And so we as leaders, I feel like we've failed in all of that. Because Christianity, it always begins with a lot of joy. It ends with a lot of joy. But in between, there's some really tough times. But Paul said that Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He didn't just invent it. He didn't just start it. But he shows us how to go through it. And when you look at Jesus' life and the things that he suffered, I don't mean on the cross. I mean day to day. As I sat in my truck Friday night, and I, don't, I can't sleep on my back. I just can't do it. I have to sleep on my stomach. It's hard to sleep in a truck that's not six feet long, on my stomach, trying to figure out a place to put my head. I forgot a pillow. Mandy stinks next to me. She smells like wet dog. She's right next to me. I can't sleep. And all I could think of was Jesus slept outside without a tent every day and didn't have Phil waiting for him for breakfast the next day. <laughs> he had fig trees that didn't have fruit on them when he got to them. It's those day-to-day things. He's the author and the perfecter of the faith. And there's things that I have learned on this trail that I wish somebody had told me about. I really wish they had told me about it ahead of time and had given me some of the things. But we, we stuck with it. But the enemy uses these things to discourage us and to tell you, look, you have faith in God. That's all you need. Just go about your way. Let those Christians do all the crazy things they do. You don't need that. That's what the enemy does. And what he does is he turns you from a disciple into a convert. And you no longer have any effect for Jesus at all. You just live your life. You're a Christian. You believe in God. But you have no effect on other people like this video that we saw where these people do have an effect on other people. Things happen. And the helmet of protection helps us along those ways. So I'm going to give you a little list of things that maybe nobody's ever told you about that you need to know. And I might word these things badly. I might word these things in a way that might actually even offend you. Okay, nobody's texting me at the moment. It was Verizon let me know I just got my bill. So just let you know, so no big deal. So anyway, number one, if you're keeping a list of these things, this is the weird thing, okay? Number one, Christians will break your heart. It's the number one thing. It's not part of doctrine. Christians will break your heart. Okay, why do we say that? Because we are all weak. We are all immature We all need to be perfected in God. We do things, we say things that sometimes are just simply stupid. They're out of our flesh. They're not from God's heart. And they hurt other people. It's just the way it is. We've all done it. Nobody here is excluded from it. We all do things that will break somebody else's heart. We speak and act out of the flesh. Here's here's what you've got to remember. Never blame God for that action. Never blame God for that action. Don't hold it against God. Don't hold it against anybody. Just be prepared for it. People are going to say things that are going to break your heart. Don't quit. The pain that you learn going through those things is going to help the next person who also goes through it. The pain that you endure and the comfort you get from God as you go through it is going to help the next person that goes through it. We are an imperfect family. Anybody here from a perfect family? Okay, so if, if you've just... <laughs> points, she gets points. <laughs> Birthday coming up? Oh yeah, September. Okay, um, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Perfect family. I don't remember her birthday. Right, August 18th. Okay, and I think there's somebody else here has a birthday coming up on July 24th. It's Thursday night. You might want to put that on your calendars. I think somebody's turning 80 soon on that day. But at any rate. Um, 80. I don't know of anybody here that would be, you know, I just thought I'd throw that out. So anyway, <clears throat> we are an imperfect family. And if you come to Family of Hope think I found the perfect family, you might as well just leave right now because something's going to happen. I can guarantee you. In, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul writes this. This is really cool. I've never actually seen it this way until it just came to my mind as I put this together. It says, Paul says, God has given in the church a variety of gifts. He's given a variety of ministries. And then this key thing, he goes, and a variety of effects that goes with it. I'm like, effects? What's effects? What does that mean? 
lots of variety of effects. All these different personalities with all these different gifts and the way that it kind of works sometimes kind of rubs some of us the wrong way. It just doesn't match. They don't always mix really well as we're growing in God. Some of us don't actually play well with others. You know, we just, we're, we just, why does everything seem to work better when I just do everything my way? We don't really play well with others. We, we need to learn that. Some of us try to manipulate others to do things the way we want it to be done all the time. Some of us, when we encounter those things, we just give up and walk away. Just forget it. I don't need that. That's not playing well with others either. We're not seeing our calling as disciples, the commission that Jesus has given us. We're not seeing this, the disciplined ones. I just want to know, if you're here today and you've been hurt and you've been holding back because of that, God's calling you to come forward, not to let that be the thing that, that's stumbling block in your way anymore. If you're here today and you've never been hurt, get ready. It's going to happen. You're going to get hurt. Someone's going to say something's going to hurt. It's really going to hurt. Somebody left the church before any of you got here today because somebody said something that was offensive to them. It just happens. It happens. I'll, ta- I'll take care of it later. But it happens. It's part of it. Reach out to other people that have been through those things. Reach out to them. Number two. It's kind of related to number one, but it's a little bit different. Number two. Not everybody that you're going to meet who professes Christ actually knows him. Not everybody who professes Christ actually knows him. Some people have strictly been connected to the doctrine of Christ and have never touched or known his heart and don't actually know how to do that and are not going to until somebody actually shows them. And if you're talking to somebody who's strictly from that doctrinal point of view, you could say something about what you're going through in your life and their answer is always going to be some kind of doctrinal answer back to you that in their mind cures everything and in your mind is meaningless and insensitive. That's just the way it is. Love, the love of God, is the, should be the key focus in our lives. It should be what motivates us and it should be, it, it just, it's everything. Don't let such a person discourage you ever. Okay, number three. If you're writing these things down, we're almost done. Number three. I, I try to think of a really careful way to put this and I couldn't think of one so I'm just going to throw it at you good God will not meet all of your expectations God will not meet your expectations anybody ever been told that when you came to the Lord nobody told me that God will not meet your expectations why is that I can tell you these things. You are the only one that can hinder God from having his will in your life. You are the only one. Not anybody else. It's not going to be God. It's not going to be anybody else or anything else in your life. You're the only one that can hinder God from having his will in your life. He will, if you say yes to him, have his will in your life, whether that is what you expected to happen or not. So that leads to, number two, well then what expectations do you have in your life? What is it that you expected? Um, James writes, you know, sometimes you don't have because you never asked. So our first encouragement there is maybe you should think about asking God for what you want. Okay? Some of us, maybe somebody never thought of that. But then he goes on, he says, but you ask and you don't have because you ask with the wrong motivation obvious example of that Janis Joplin saying a long time ago Lord please buy me a Mercedes Benz might have had the wrong motivation there you know but we kind of do the same thing with other things that are not quite so obvious don't we kind of asking God for things that maybe that wasn't part of his will for your life maybe that your motivation is selfish Maybe your motivation is you want to be comforted by that thing rather than him. Who knows? You, you, probably only you can answer that question. 
But where did these expectations that you have that are not from him come from? Some of those expectations come from religion. Some of those expectations we have of God actually comes from good, um, well-meaning religious origins. Some of them actually teach us that if you're a good person, God's going to give you these things that you expect in your life. And I've run into people whose loved ones have died even though they were being good and doing what they thought God wanted. And their loved one died and they're bitter against God. They're actually bitter against God for a loved one dying. Where do these expectations come from? I wanted that job. I prayed for that job. I've been good. I've done everything that God's wanted me to to do. And I didn't get that job. You know what? Forget it. I'm not doing this anymore. Where does that come from? It doesn't come from Him. Because the scripture on the sign we have out front says, says, God says, I have a plan for you. You need to underline the word I have a plan for you. See, God has a plan for you, and guess what? He didn't ask you what your ideas were in this plan. He didn't say, okay, I'm putting a plan together for you. Where would you like to go? He's not a travel agent. Okay? He has a plan for you that he's determined from the beginning of time. If you really want to be happy and comforted in this life, you'll find out what his plan is and lay yours aside. And those will be your expectations. Those will be your expectations. I was talking to somebody this week who was suffering, still suffering to this day from knee replacements. She's had a hip replacement. She's had back surgery. And she's still suffering from pain. And, And she's going through this big thing. And she wrote to me in her email. She goes, I know that God has already healed me. So I'm just, I'm just being... I don't know, whatever. I took a deep breath because I don't always tackle doctrinal things when, someone, when they come across me. But I took a deep breath and I just said, I really admire you for your strength and your faithfulness and your sticking in with it. I said, I'm not really buying your God's already healed you thing. I said, because if he's already healed you, you'd be standing, you'd be walking without any pain and you wouldn't have any problems. You wouldn't be laying on the couch moaning and groaning and taking Vicodin several times a day. I had no idea what response I was going to get from this person because I've gotten some really bad responses from doing stuff like that in the past. And she said back to me, you know what? You're right. I just didn't know what else to say because that's what our church believes. But she goes, but I've been feeling guilty because I'm not healed. Because that line of thinking, that doctrine teaches us that God's already healed you. So if you have the faith, you are already healed. And if you're not healed, because you are already healed, then you lack the faith. So there's something wrong with you. And I've told you before, I know of a young man who was 35 years old who had a stroke and he was an elder in one of these churches and they kicked him out of the church after six months because he still had the symptoms of the stroke. And he came to me feeling guilty, down like, like he was a bad child of God. So, I'm not saying that God, if the scripture says by his stripes we are healed. All I'm telling you is that, I, what I wrote back to her was, look, I went through five knee operations on my left knee. And just last summer, It swelled up again and it hurt again and I got my cane out of the closet and I started limping around again and I've been already prayed for at least 30 or 40 times by people that love me and know me and it didn't work and I went back down to the doctor they pulled out more blood more fluid out of my knee and they said we don't know why your knee's doing this great and then somebody prayed for me again and it just went away I have never had any trouble since So, I believe in healing. I just don't believe in playing games with it. You're either healed or you're not. So let's, let's believe it. But the fact of the matter is that 
Paul said, Paul said, <clears throat> I've got this thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it is. You know, Bible scholars have been arguing for centuries over what that was. But God said, I'm going to let you keep it. Today is English. I'm going to let you keep that one. My grace is sufficient for you. Sometimes he heals and sometimes he doesn't. I also know that there's not very many Elijahs walking around, that they are, and then they suddenly are not. That most of us die from something. So, you know, when it says that we are healed, we're healed when God heals us. Don't walk around in guilt as a result of that. These are expectations that people put on each other and on themselves. It's not from God. Pray for healing and believe in it. Maybe you have a medical problem because God wants you to be in a situation to speak to another patient who happens to be in the same office. Maybe. You don't know. You don't know. All I could do is I think of John the Baptist. Jesus said, John the Baptist, there's no, no greater man has ever walked the earth than John the Baptist. What was his expectations when he said yes to Jesus? Because I can tell you what he got. He got really crappy food. And he lived outdoors. And he got beheaded. That was his life. He didn't become CEO of Ford. You know, drive around the best things. He ate crappy food and he got beheaded. Actually, beheading is not really a bad way to go pretty quick yeah it's not an ouch you don't feel anything it's boom you're done you know so you know yeah <laughs> okay, we'll talk about this later but anyway what kind of expectations did John the Baptist have in life you know what he did he was like I don't have any because the Bible says God has a plan for me and this is his plan his plan is for me to eat honey, which you've got to get stung for, and locusts, which I'm sure were delicious, probably made by Krauss's. Krauss's locusts. You ever heard of them? No, nope, never me either. And he wore camel's hair, which that's really got to be comfortable in, this, in, the, in this, you know, the desert, right? Camel's hair. I complain when there's a seam itching me. Made out of cotton. Unbelievable. What has God promised you? I went online to my bank thing. I had a new bank recently and went on in line and filled out all of the um, security questions in case if something happens. They ask you a security question like, where were you born? What's your favorite pet? Your first job? Blah, blah. One of them asked me, said, what is your dream job? Never been asked that before. And you know what popped into my head? Because if you think this is it, you're wrong. What is your dream job? Scotch taster. I said, if I had my way, I'd be in Scotland working for a distillery, and that would be my job every day, tasting scotch. No, this one's a little weak. Let's put this one back in for another couple of years. Yeah. yeah. It's just an idea, folks, that we all have these expectations that are not of God. Hello? Yeah, that's an obvious one. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. Okay, I'm going to end with the last one. Last one for today. There are times of dryness that we go through. There are times of dryness. Nobody told me this. But all of a sudden I found myself like, what's happening? Where did, where did God go? How come I'm not feeling anything? And How come everything everybody says to me is, like, doesn't mean anything to me? And Why am I reading the Bible and I'm not getting anything out of this? The pastor told me if I read the Bible, I'm really going to get blessed. I'm not getting blessed by reading the Bible. What is going on here? I've got other things to do, and besides, there's a good movie playing. Times of dryness. There's this guy, there's this Christian guy, they went to, they started this place up in Norway or somewhere. I forget where it was, but it was over there. And he, they built this place, and they wanted to put trees in, but there was no trees in the area at all for a reason. Trees don't grow there. 
and he saw, talked to lo, one of the local horticulturists, said, I'd like to plant trees. How come nobody plants trees around here? And the guy said to him, because there's not enough soil above the bedrock to support trees. And it's almost always calm, except occasionally for a big storm. He goes, well, so what? He goes, okay, you really want to plant a tree? Here's what you're going to have to do. I'll never forget this, ever. He goes, you are going to build, you're going to dig a ditch, a hole in the ground. It's going to be about 10 feet around in diameter. 10 feet around. And you're going to dig that about 12 feet down through the bedrock. And then you're going to fill that with really good soil. And then you can plant a tree. He goes, oh, that's it? He goes, no, 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 wait a minute. He goes, and then every day, once your tree takes hold and the leaves grow, every day you're going to go out and you're going to grab a hold of the sapling and you're going to yank it around. You're going to put pressure on it like the wind's blowing. Every day. You go out there every day, every one of them, yank it around, put like pressure on it. He goes, what's that going to do? He goes, that's going to make the roots grow deep. He said, because trees, like, like all the rest of us, they don't do anything unless they're under pressure. You take, when you go have, buy property and you have the all, it's all woods and you want to put a house in it, one of the mistakes some people make is they only cut the trees just enough for the house and they leave certain trees exposed that have never been exposed before and then the first big wind comes along and down goes the tree because the tree's never been exposed to wind the root system's shallow and it falls over we get deepened by the dryness we get de deepened by the dryness so I don't have all the answers for why we go through this dryness but that's one of them that's one of them Psalm 1 says that we are like a tree that's planted firmly by streams of living water, and that's one of God's plans. It puts us through a dry time for our roots to grow down deeper. Because, because God, I don't know why, maybe it's related to that, but God is a God who likes to be sought after. He just likes to be sought after. He didn't go to Moses. He was up in the mountain. And he waited for Moses to go to him. He didn't go to him. He waited for Moses to go to him. It's almost like, it's like God is saying, are you going to seek me or are you going to do what's easy? Are you going to seek me or are you going to do what comes easiest and more natural for you? Are you going to go through all those other things? God wants to be sought after. And he tests you to see if you want to seek him more than those other things. Test you. I just want, just remember for a moment, when God tests you, it's not so that he knows the answer. Okay? We get a test in school. The teacher wants to know if you've been listening. God gives you a test. He already knows the answer. It's for you to know. He puts you through a test so you know, oh man, I didn't really want God like I thought I said I did. That's what it's for. The third part of this is that, and I don't know why, but it seems like God likes to move in waves. It seems like he likes to move in waves. Like the waves of an ocean, he moves and he stops. And then he moves again and he stops. I suspect it's related to this war that he, that he likes to sneak. He likes to do something without telling anybody he's doing it. So the enemy can't get in there and spoil it before it happens. That's what I suspect is going on. But I don't know. But all the way from movements of God that happen, and then there's a lull, and then there's another move, and then there's a lull. It's the same thing in our life. And I just came through a month of like, God, where are you? Until yesterday. It's just like that. So if that's what you've been going through and you've been wondering, what is this all about? How come he's so, he's, that person's always so excited in God, there must be something wrong with me. I Forget it, I'm out of here. Don't do that. Embrace these things. People are going to be idiots. We're an imperfect family. You've probably ex been expecting things that you shouldn't have been expecting. And God puts you through dry times so that you will seek him. 